Welcome in Outkick 360 across the Outkick network. Alongside Paul Koharski, I'm Jonathan Hutton. Glad you're with us. Chad Withrow back with us next week. Lance Lee, Jakob Swanson. We have Sarah Triplett. David Reed is the chairman of the board. Becca Risley and Sleepy Danny down the hall as we broadcast live. Studio G in Nashville, Tennessee. Blackbird Studios and the BlackbirdAcademy.com is where we are live each and every day here across the OutKick Network. We hope that if you're watching on YouTube, you'll hit the subscribe button, you'll hit the like button, give us the thumbs up, and that you will ring that bell so you're alerted every time we go live each and every day for the show. Paul and I did not plan to match today, but we do celebrate Easter on July the 1st. It's already been pointed out. A couple of days before we celebrate our country's birth. Paul, good morning. Fourth of July is coming, but uh, we're looking for jelly beans today, and they, <laughs> they've not been provided. Reese's, Reese's. eggs. <laughs> Reese's eggs. But nobody is bringing us the Easter food that we crave. Good day. What a day for college sports. July 1st, 2021 is what we're going to remember because of name, image, likeness, and the transition from old to new. Uh, the new day, the new dawn for college sports is here where players, athletes across the board can profit on their name, image, and likeness. Something that the lapdog media from years ago would say would never happen and that the NCAA was made of amateurs and that's how it should stay. How quickly those same people are now turning their opinion around based on today's announcement. And we knew this was coming, Paul. Um, all except for the NCAA based on how they've set things up because for all of the regulations, all the rules for college sports and college athletes and what teams and, and, and universities must adhere by, no regulations really for this. They, they have a waiver that's intended to hold things, be a bridge until there's either A, federal legislation that will cover NIL across the board, across the country, state to state, or they have passed a more permanent NIL rule. But right now, it, it's pretty much up to the university to go by whatever state guidelines are in place. And that means it's open season. They are open for business. Mackenzie Milton, uh, De'Eric King, they have teamed up in Florida, the quarterbacks at Florida State and the quarterback at Miami, they have teamed up. They have formed Dreamfield, which is an agency for NIL, current players putting their names with an agency for name, image, likeness, where a player or an athlete of any sport in Tennessee, in Indiana, in Montana, they can call up Dream Dreamfield, and they'll take 15% off the top of all profits, but they'll set you up for an autograph signing. They'll set you up for an endorsement and you have an agency working for you that's been in the works for over 12 months and this by two quarterbacks in the same conference. This is where we're headed and it's going to be huge because I think companies now that can't afford an NFL player might be able to afford a college sports athlete and I think the, the different paths you can take is endless with this. It's, it's a very interesting day, and I'm interested to see how the whole thing pans out. But I, I, uh, I also wonder if, to a degree, where our expectations for it are over the top. I do think, you know, obviously for the big quarterbacks, the Heisman Trophy candidates, program-defining players, it's going to be big. Um, for uh, more middling players at big programs, certainly it's going to be big because it's going to be a way that boosters find ways to uh, benefit and lure people or serve people that they've lured to the program. Um, but I've already seen a lot out there about, hey, now go out there, kids, and create your personal brand. And I think for, you know, the... A kid who's not scoring touchdowns, creating your personal brand is a little bit overrated if you're not. Your personal brand has to start with being a good football player and, and playing good football, <clears throat> I think, and outside of these people who want to help you, right? There are going to be a certain population 
at certain universities who want to help you. They're going to come find you. But in terms of your going finding them, this create your own brand thing. You'll remember we did uh, like a seminar with, with college kids who wanted to be journalists. And some of the people on the panel were telling kids, go, go create your personal brand. And I was saying, nobody gives a shit about your personal brand until you have something to offer, right? If, if you're a kid with an opinion on the Yankees, nobody cares about your opinion on the Yankees until you've done something. Well, that's why you have to build it. Right. And that's well, what Olivia Dunn, a gymnast at LSU, has done. She has 1.1 million Instagram followers, 3.9 million TikTok followers. You think she's going to profit off of her NIL? Absolutely. How did she get those followers? She though? built her own personal brand. With what? With her own name, image, and likeness. She yeah, built her you, own personal brand on social media, right, but and she not, didn't follow your advice. But you, Yeah, but you're not giving me the information I'm looking for. I bet there's some good gymnastics involved in it. I would say there's great Instagram and TikTok posts involved in it. I'm sure there are. But the reason that she got a foothold, I'm guessing, is because she was good at gymnastics. Um, and now, and I'm, I know there are TikTok and, and whatever people who, who are good at TikTok and who get famous by being good at TikTok. But if you're an athlete, an NCAA athlete, you're going to have to dedicate a lot of time to sports and getting good at your sport. And your foothold for most people is going to be being good at your sport. And being good at TikTok and all of that stuff. I, I would say... Be good at your sport is my advice to you. First and foremost, be good at your sport. You'll have to be good at your sport, but you can also be good at publicizing your name, image, and likeness and your personal brand, which Olivia has done. If you look at her accounts, you have no idea she's a gymnast. gymnast let's put it that way. And now at LSU, she will be making money off of her NIL uh, instead of LSU promoting the fact that they have an athlete that has 3.4 million TikTok followers. And she should absolutely be making money off of that. But I think the marketplace now flooded with people who think they're going to be uh, TikTok stars uh, who need a hook. All of these people need a hook. And to me, if you're an athlete, your hook should be being a good athlete. Um, Otherwise, you're just like everybody else who can make money off well, your name, image, and likeness. Uh, a random evens, person. This evens the playing field, though, because the NCAA has been making billions off of the athlete who is a good athlete. And now that good athlete can go and profit off of that. And if they're just an average player, but they have a big presence on social media, they can still go profit off of that. I'm all for this, and I've been for this for uh, years. I'm all for it, too. I think saying, though, that we've seen a co like five years ago that everybody was poo-pooing it, I don't know that five years ago. Oh, they absolutely were. The old, oh, the old school. The old five school. years ago, did you see this coming? Five years ago, I was arguing that Reggie Bush should not have turned in his Heisman Trophy. Right, but did you see the N NCAA folding up to this degree, losing in the Supreme Court, all of this stuff? There's a lot of stodgy politics still involved in this, ag against this. So I think it's good. But I can't say I saw it coming because I think there are a lot of political forces aligned with the NCAA who wanted, the NC, like the NCAA, this fraudulent amateurism to remain in place for as long as possible, just like the bowl system to remain in place for as long as possible. There were just I'm a glad lot of people, the gates have broken open, there are a lot of people, but I didn't expect it. There are a lot of people, if you didn't see this coming, you were buying into a hope and a dream and buying into the pipe dream that was the fact that don't ask, don't tell. Don't ask about what's going on behind the scenes, both at the top level of the NCAA or the college basketball tournament or the college football playoff. I mean, there are people that thought we would never see a college football playoff. And now we're talking about expanding, not to eight, not doubling, expanding to 12, to 14, to 16, because there's so much money to be made off of this. And everyone was getting a piece of the pie, except for the players, wink, wink. They were getting paid too, and now they're getting paid on the up and up. That's how I view this. They're getting paid underneath the table. We've seen death penalties come down. The old joke that uh, the NCAA is so mad at, at LSU that they're going to punish University of Louisiana Lafayette, right? That's no more because we're, it's, it's open season, and it's, it's, it's a landscape-changing moment today 
that I think five years from now we look back on and say, this was when things turned. This was when Mark Emmert stopped waving the flag that says amateurism lives on. Uh, and it, it's the new version of the sports amateur. It's a flood, though, and I'm anxious to see, like, how deep the pool is and how it finds its depth. Um, it's going to be an interesting time. I'm curious how long it takes for the pool to find the depth and for maybe a company to say, oh, yeah. we overshot on how many people we're interested in, or for kids to say, oh, you know, a certain level kid to say, oh, I thought I was going to do a lot better. Or for a kid to say, wow, I had no idea I could do this well. I'm very curious to find what the, in the, what the depth is. In the age of social media, I think people are going to undervalue instead of overvalue what that means. I mean, last night at 1130 Central Time, people are tweeting out from different companies, if you want to make a quick hundred bucks and you're a college athlete, DM me for a tweet. There's, there's endless possibilities with this, and it goes beyond just car dealerships and autograph right, signs. But I'm very curious to see what that tweet is and who it's from. We're, I, I think we'll see, uh, we, we could potentially see players wearing, a, uh, wearing more of a name brand apparel uh, logo um, outside of school functions instead of wearing the school issued gear. Uh, I could see that happening. Well, that's an also, interesting development, it, like, like we see pros do wearing in and out of the arena. Yeah. I, I, I also think, too, what university, because, again, this is, this is going to be regulated by the individual universities. So consider that, we'll just use Tennessee as an example, and I don't even know, and I'll ask Brent Hubs this tomorrow, if they're a Pepsi or a Coke product school. But if the opposite wants to sponsor the star quarterback, can they do that? Can you, can you have the star quarterback go opposite of whatever is on the table? This makes me think. Ronaldo at a press conference in Europe after a Portugal game, there were two Coke bottles yeah. sitting at his thing. He sat down, took yep. the two Coke bottles, put them off screen. Obviously not a Coke guy. I don't know if he's a Pepsi guy or what he is, but he's not a Coke guy. He's not giving away free exposure with him with Coke bottles sitting in front of him, where he's not a beneficiary of that, but the European Championships, UEFA, whatever governing bodies, et cetera, are, poor Portugal maybe, are benefiting from that, but he personally are not. We're going to see a lot more things like that. And who's going to stop a kid, a pro athlete, whoever, from removing those bottles at that time, unless they nail those down? There's the first idea. The Coke bottles are now going to be uh, on cement blocks, again, <laughs> that can't be easily moved. I, I see this as a much bigger deal than what I think people are even imagining because of what universities and what contracts are in place versus what players could potentially bring to the table and how those things intertwine and the recruiting aspect of that. Oh, you're an Adidas school? Uh, think of the AAU contracts. You're an Adidas school, you have a leg up on the team that sponsors the AAU team and the player you're recruiting. That, that, this goes a layer or two deeper than just, oh, how many, how many Twitter followers do you have? And the Nike we, we kids will, we will not see, and, to you. And the NCAA has told the high school athlete now, they can, they can go ahead and set this up. Uh, there's nothing to regulate that end of it either. Prospective student athletes still in high school may also engage in the same types of NIL opportunities without impacting their NCAA eligibility. And there's That's al huge. already been cases where the top AAU kid is maybe limiting his uh, recruitment list based on he's a Nike kid and he's not looking at an Adidas school. So that grows now because the high school kid can be solicited in a way that maybe previously he was wary of. Coming up, we discuss NFL headlines with John McClain, the big three quarterbacks going into year four, Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen. It sounds as though all of those teams would like to get a deal done before year four is up instead of waiting on year five in those contract negotiations. We'll get McClain's thoughts on that. Plus, some breaking news in the NHL where Victor Arvidsson of the Nashville Predators has been traded to the LA Kings. 
We will hit that during the Tennessee Power Hour. That and much more straight ahead on OutKick 360. First, though, look, erectile dysfunction affects over half of all men. It doesn't have to make you feel like half of a man. MyDrHank.com slash OutKick here for you. Since 2017, My Dr. Hank has been making America hard again. My Dr. Hank helps you get low-cost ED meds, overcome the psychological and emotional barriers to getting ED treatment. They secure your prescription. They then ship it to you discreetly every month from USA Pharmacies for as low as $2 per pill. Paul, it's a great offer. 50% off your first subscription order if you go to MyDrHank.com slash OutKick to sign up for the first go-round. 50% off. We're giving you some great discounts here at OutKick 360. 50% off. MyDrHank.com slash OutKick.
Outkick 360 across the Outkick network. Glad you're with us today. And as always, we hope that you'll subscribe on the YouTube channel where you can sign up and uh, you're automatically signed up if you subscribe to the Sony and Hertz Odyssey Prize Pack. We'll tell you more about that coming up. We'll also take more of your phone calls at 855 208 8806. Right now, though, we turn our attention to the NFL. NFL headlines with John McClain, who has covered the NFL for more than four decades. He joins us from Houston, where you can read his work at texassportsnation.com. John, hope you're doing well. Jonathan and Paul, I'm doing great. Hope you guys are too, and I hope all your viewers and listeners have a great board. Absolutely, same, same to you. Uh, I had a great weekend this past weekend. I sent you a video of this. Uh, for those that don't know, John, is a, he's been in several films. Um, one of those was Spring Breakers. How long ago was this, John? This is like seven or eight years ago now, probably. Yeah, it was something like that. I'm still getting residuals, I think, <laughs> uh, from that. And uh, it's on cable like multiple times a day. Yeah. Done by Harmony yeah. Corinne from there in Nashville. And his wife, Rachel, was one of the stars. It was a lot of fun. And I get a kick out of watching it. Um, I close my eyes when I'm on because I think I'm terrible. But I got them wide open for the rest of that. Oh, month. hey, <laughs> I turned I turned on Spring Breakers at the right time because John John plays a judge in the movie, and uh, there are girls in bikinis in the courtroom, and I turned on HBO or Showtime or whatever this was on Cinemax, Skinemax. I don't I'm not sure, John. Uh, I I turned it on at the right time, right as John McClain was having his speaking role, talk, talking and addressing the courtroom. And so I pause it, I video it, send it to John late Friday night. He responded Saturday morning with, uh, I really enjoyed filming that scene. <laughs> and I would. It took I us nine too. hours, nine hours to film that scene. And the first <laughs> take I had, Harmony Corinne, the director, the director says, cut, judge, you can't sentence them unless you look at them. And I'm thinking, man, I feel like a dirty old man. We're talking about Selena Gomez and Vanessa Hutchins and, Ashley Benson and his wife, Rachel, but I did. And uh, most of the nine hours was taken up for all the shots and the lighting they needed to do for James Franco, who was introduced in the movie in the courtroom. And, uh, but it was so much fun. I had a blast. People ask me about that movie all the time because it's on so much. And they say, what have you done since then? I said, well, I should have fired my agent because I haven't done anything. Problem is my agent is me. <laughs> you can follow John and his agent on Twitter at McLean underscore on underscore NFL. John, I'd like to start 
speaking of agents, Lamar Jackson doesn't have one. His mother, I believe, is representing him in co contract negotiations with the Baltimore Ravens, who we know have, have been true negotiators in the past. Uh, he is one of three quarterbacks going into year four and on teams that apparently want to get a deal done before the end of year four. And I, I don't know how realistic that is for all three, Josh Allen, Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson. But in Lamar Jackson's case, it sounds as though Baltimore would like to get a deal done prior to the start of the season. Do you see one happening? And if so, why now? Why not wait a year? If indeed his mother is negotiating that contract, I don't blame the Ravens for wanting to get it done. Uh, I would hope uh, that she is listening carefully to the NFL Players Association where they have experts who will help with any question. They can't do the negotiation themselves, but they can certainly help with it. And obviously someone who's not done a contract like that is going to need a lot of help, and he deserves to be very highly paid. He's not going to make more money total than Patrick Mahomes, but he can move right up there. I think Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson need to be the next two done, and then Baker Mayfield. All three of those guys, of course, were in the playoffs last year. All three like to think they're Super Bowl contenders this year. The quicker you get those contracts done, the less it costs you. The Texans redid John Watson with two years left, and they did it. At a time, people are like, man, that's the second most money in history. And now it might not be in the top five a year later. Patrick Mahomes, uh, that deals 10 years, what, 430? Um, a real out something like that. Yeah, a real outlier, really. Um, how much does that inform these deals, or how much is that kind of regarded as an outlier when you're talking about guys who clearly are not as good as Patrick Mahomes? Well, first of all, that's just a big m number that uh, Patrick Mahomes liked. His agent, Lee Steinberg, liked that that contract would be redone so many times before it's actually up. And uh, uh, I just, at the time, I didn't think very much about it, unprecedented in the number and the length as well. But uh, there's no way they're going to hold him to that. He'll be, I'm guessing he'll have it redone in a couple of years if he continues to play the way he has. John, the contract is not Patrick Mahomes that these players will be looking at. It is Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott holds the current record in NFL history for most money at guaranteed at signing at $95 million for signing his name on a contract. That is the money that these players will be looking at, right? Absolutely. They want money that's guaranteed against skill and injury, and they also want what's in the first three years. Beyond the first three years, just paper money, but it's how much is he going to make in the first three years? What's the average? How much of that signing bonus does he get up front? Does he get all of it? Is it spaced out over two or three years? There's a lot of ways to do those contracts, but most agents, the good agents, it's a payout over the thir first three years that they can point to with most pride. Well, and, and that's the example for why the, the, the teams would like to get a deal done now instead of two or three years from now. Dak Prescott I'm talking about because of the way that he ended up getting paid in the end after the franchise tag was applied to him. He gets a four-year, $160 million contract. Um, on the other side of things, we see Jared Goff, who signed after year three. He's now been traded. Uh, there are other examples of discussions that were at least had locally, I can speak to this. We were discussing Marcus Mariota and Jameis Winston. Now, they didn't get contract extensions after year three, but it was discussed what that might be like. And had the Titans decided to do that after year three for Marcus, he actually had his best season in Nashville after year three. We, we know what happened there. Where do you come down on the decision that teams have to make on knowing that they have a fifth-year option but choosing not to even get close to that fifth year with their quarterback contracts. If the Titans thought Marcus Mariota was the long-term answer, they would have redone it. Obviously, they didn't. Same thing with Tampa Bay. If you believe that your quarterback is your franchise guy for the next decade, you need to sign him as soon as you can because ultimately it'll cost you a lot less money. The longer you wait, the more it's going to cost you. 
And if you decide after the fourth year, he's not the guy that's egg on your face because you screwed up by drafting him or you got poor coaching or a system that didn't fit him. A lot of times these quarterbacks who are highly rated coming out of college, if they don't make it, it's not their fault. It's the team's fault because of who they put around him, the system they put him in, the instability on the coaching staff. One of those guys who, who got the long-term deal, uh, Hutt mentioned Goff. Carson Wentz got that long-term deal, ultimately didn't pan out in Philadelphia. He's in a new place in Indianapolis, a lot less scrutiny. His marriage with a remarriage with Frank Reich, um, how do you expect it to go? How quickly do you expect it to take off? And where, where does it put the Colts now after a year with Phillip Rivers uh, in the pecking order, in the division, and in the AFC in your, in your early thinking? Four quarterbacks in four years. That kind of instability is not good. I did a Philadelphia show this morning, and they asked me the same question about what I thought about Wentz going to Indianapolis and how that affected the AFC South. I said, guys, you know better than anybody. If Wentz was a great quarterback, he'd still be in Philadelphia. He wouldn't be in Indianapolis. Now, whether those are physical or mental, based on everything I've seen and heard, a lot of his problems up there were mental. Uh, some of the teammates didn't like him. Uh, didn't, he got mad because they drafted Jalen Hurts and he wasn't the same. And you can't have a quarterback who worries about things like that. Now, Frank Reich should know him very well. And I like to think that may, maybe if he had not gotten hurt, he would have been an MVP and uh, it would have, would have been him instead of Nick Foles to win the Super Bowl and get an MVP and he'd still be up there. But based on what's happened, the Eagles made a huge mistake giving him that contract. They should have known at that point what they had and they didn't do a good job. I picked the Titans last year. I picked the Titans this year before they got Julio Jones and I continue to pick the Titans. I think it'll both of them will be in the playoffs again. Indianapolis has the better defense. Titans have the better running game. Titans have the better passing game. Ryan Tannehill has been great with the Titans, and I'm sure Indianapolis is saying, hey, look at Ryan Tannehill. Look at him after he left Miami for Tennessee, and that's the same thing's going to happen to Carson Wentz, and if it does, it'll make the division so much better. I believe strongly it'll be Tennessee, Indy, Jacksonville, with the Texans cleaning up the rear. Why do you think there's so much affection for the Colts nationally? They've won one playoff game since Frank Reich and Chris Ballard got there. But I was listening the other day on ESPN with former players talking about what a great coach Frank Reich is. And I think a lot of his people respect Frank for what he did in college, for what he did in the NFL when he pulled off two of the greatest comebacks in history. He was highly regarded at San Diego with Philadelphia and he became a head coach and everybody likes it. You know, if you like a guy, you're going to bend over backward to do what you can to make him look good. And same thing with Chris Ballard. I think they have done a good job. You can't say great for either one of them when they've won one playoff game. Maybe that changes this season and they win the division and they go to the Super Bowl and then you can say they're great. But to me, I'm going with the Titans who won more playoff games two years ago than the Colts have won since Frank Wright got there. John McClain with us. He's with the Houston Chronicle. You can follow him on Twitter at McClain underscore on underscore NFL. John, speaking of Philly, Zach Ertz uh, is on the, the trade market. That's been no secret this offseason. The Bills continue to be mentioned as a potential landing spot. They have Dawson Knox. They have also added uh, Jacob Hollister to that group. Why do they need Zach Ertz? I think that they think they can get him cheap, not financially, but what it would require. They need to worry about their running game. You know, they can't have Josh Allen at this stage of his career continuing to run as much as he does and take as many hits as he takes because at some point that punishment is going to get to him and it's going to cause him a problem. But if Ertz, if Ertz could still play the way he used to, I think the Eagles – would not be interested in trading one of the most popular players in franchise history who helped them win a Super Bowl at this stage. I don't know what he's got left. I heard somebody this morning on NFL radio talking about, man, Kyle, Kyle Rudolph. Where did Kyle Rudolph go? I don't even remember. 
wherever, wherever he went, what a great thing it was going to be for that team. And I think it was going to be great. Why did Minnesota let him go? I'll do a quick search on that because I don't recall off the top of my head either. He's with the Giants. Oh, he's in New York. How about that? He's had some foot I had no surgery. idea. I'm sure he's going to make a big difference in, the, in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you can get to help Daniel Jones, I guess. John, where do you have the Bills in your AFC pecking order right now? Right now, of course, I have Kansas City as the number one team. And uh, I think the AFC is stronger than the NFC. I think the AFC North is really good. I think the AFC West is the best division in football. I think the AFC East is two teams, Buffalo and Miami, and, of course, the AFC South. And I'd like – in Cleveland, I want to believe in the Browns. I want to believe in the Ravens. Other than the Chiefs, it's wide open. I would say based on what the Bills have done in the last two years, which is get improving a play in each of the last three years, I'd say they're the second best team. And it's within Baltimore, Tennessee, uh, both of those teams, I think. And I'm sorry, I said the AFC West. It's the NFC West that I think is the best division in football. AFC West, not very good after Kansas City. But I think Buffalo would be two. And I say Tennessee and Baltimore would be right there with Cleveland. And a team that I think will be good that other people don't seem to think so is Pittsburgh because I think Najee Harris is going to give them a running game. I think he's my pick for offensive rookie of the year. They were last in rushing. That's not going to last long. It depends on all the changes they made in the offensive line. I don't believe in anything in the AFC South beyond the Titans and Colts. don't believe in anything in the AFC West after the Chiefs and the East. You got Buffalo, maybe the Dolphins if Tua Tagovailoa becomes the quarterback they thought he could be. And then there's the three teams from the AFC North, and it's going to be fascinating watching them jockey for position to see who is going to be the most compelling competitor for the Chiefs. John, uh, I'm just thinking of this. Otherwise, I would have given you a heads up on this question. And, Paul, put your thinking cap and your memory cap on for this as well. Tom Brady admitted, to to no one's surprise, that he's not, honest in press conferences. He says 90% of what he says is BS and not really what he's thinking. Again, that's no surprise. That's the majority of players and coaches nowadays. Over your years, and go back as far as you want with this, John, who have been the most honest players that you've talked with on a weekly basis, on an annual basis, whatever it might be, who did you feel like you could sit down with and they would always shoot you straight on the record? Back in the old days, and I'm talking about when I started covering NFL in the late 70s and then in the 80s, players were more likely to speak out. Word didn't spread as fast. If you heard a player say something in, say, Cincinnati before they played the Oilers that was controversial, there's no social media to get it here, and you would have to have a reporter up there call you and say, hey, here's what Ross Browner, defensive end of the Bengals, said about the Oilers. So this is what Bruce Cosler, the offensive coordinator, said about the Oilers, or Sam Weiss. And so they would tell you and give you the quotes, and then you'd go to that people and the people, and you would ask them. When Jerry Glant, when when Bum Phillips was the Oilers coach, those guys were pretty honest. Not about injuries, but about other players. Dan Pastorini, the quarterback, was great when they got into the Jerry Glanville era, and Jerry Glanville was so outspoken The players were emboldened when it came to responding, and they were much more likely to say what they felt, and they didn't care what the fallout was because they had to go back it up on the field. And then as they got in the 90s, and then when the Internet came out, you know, they started saying assistant coaches couldn't talk to the media, media can't watch practice, and constantly, constantly reminding the players, don't give them your number, telephone numbers, Be careful what you tell them. And as time went on, usually if somebody said something, then he would create a controversy. He'd come back and he'd go, oh, I didn't mean it. Or that's, I was taken out of context. Kenny Stabler, when he was here, the Hall of Fame quarterback for two years, he was a great guy to interview because he would say what he thought. And, uh, and, but mainly the days, the days players, you don't see much. And if you do, it's because they said something controversial on social media. 
I was on the tail end of this era that he's talking about where there might be stuff from team to team. Yeah. I was more about the personal accountability that you don't really see that much anymore. And I distinctly remember, and John covered these guys, uh, the secondary when I first started covering the Titans that included uh, uh, you know, Blaine Bishop, Steve Jackson, Marcus Robertson, Samari Roll, uh, Blaine, who's terrible in the media, uh, was really good with the media, was really good with me. He'd walk by me in the locker room sometimes and say, keep writing that stuff when I was harping on, on somebody not getting the job done. Or Steve Jackson would overhear me kind of uh, pinning something on somebody in a post-game locker room and interrupt and call me over to take the blame for something because he couldn't bear the idea of somebody taking the blame for something that maybe wasn't obvious in terms of whose responsibility it was for a play. So I loved those guys and the, and the way they would take personal account or just say that the team sucked when it sucked. Samari Roll just very candidly, like, uh, you know, today we we. We didn't sucked. have it. We sucked today. But also on a more personal level, why check back at that stage? And, and guys that you know well, Delaney Walker, Logan Ryan, yeah. would give you an honest answer to an honest question and not automatically think that you had some ulterior motive or were trying to make them look bad. To me, the key thing now is a guy being confident enough in his play and in his status with the team that he knows no matter what I say, they might give me some crap. But I'm not putting my career in jeopardy well, by, most of the by time, being candid. Every quarterback, not every quarterback, the majority of quarterbacks in the league have that ability and don't they don't do it. it. Don't use it. Well, it's different with quarterbacks. But with a, with a, with a guy with a different personality yeah. on a team who feels that freedom to speak on a day like when, when Mike Malarkey was saluting the Titans, <laughs> beating the Browns very narrowly in a terribly played game in Cleveland, and everybody saying, a win's a win, hooray. Delaney Walker saying, that was crap. That's terrible. We can't be happy about that. What do you think, John? The player that, that I've covered that I have thought was great when they would lose and wouldn't hold back on anything was J.J. Watt. And uh, when he was, most of the time when he was here, they were good. Last year, they were not. And he, would, he wouldn't single out players. You should never single out individual yeah. players. But, boy, you can single out your play, your side of the ball or the team. And he went off several times last year about effort and, and being on time and things like that. And he didn't get specific, but uh, he just blasted the team. And then he told us at the end of the year he didn't want to be part of a rebuild here. And that's why he asked to get his release from the McNairs, and they let him go, 31 years old. He wanted to go where he wanted to go, didn't want to be part of a team that's going to be bad for a while, and always appreciated his candor. And, you know, it, it, and Brady was being honest with his with his answer on that, where he's, he told LeBron and the, the, the shop, that, that crew, hey, on HBO, I'm, I'm 90% of the time I'm thinking one thing and I'm saying something else publicly. But, John, isn't that extra 10% that all of the media craves? I mean, that 10% honesty, true honesty in the moment, like he did in this, in this interview and like he's done this offseason in some cases, that's what we're after. Yeah, you'd love to see that on a more consistent basis, but most no smart player is going to do it, especially a quarterback who relies on so many players to make him look good. I've always thought the quarterback is the leader, the highest-paid player, he should take the blame for every interception. Even if the guy ran the wrong route or the ball went through his hands, receivers will appreciate that. Coaches who take the blame and say, that loss is on me. Fans get tired of that, and so does the media, but the players don't. They like it when they're the ones that absorb the blame to take the heat off of them. And, and there's been a lot of players throughout my career who have been really good about saying when they're terrible. The best quote, I've ever seen in uh, in my 45 years of covering the NFL was after the Oilers blew the Buffalo playoff game in 93 and lost 41 and 38 in overtime after leading 35-3 midway through the third quarter. Their cornerback, Chris Dishman, said after the game, we choked. We choked from the top of the organization to the bottom. We choked from the owner downs to the groundskeeper. And he just went on and on the big headline 
in a chronicle said we choked with a quote mark around it and that's why here that game is always known as the choke the biggest one in nfl history and other players were great about saying man we were terrible but man would you say a team chokes players do not like to hear it coaches don't like to hear it but the fact is they choked just like texas mm-hmm. choked the winning four old league at kansas city in 2019 in the divisional round that kept them from hosting the titans in the AFC Championship game. John, things look to be better for the Cowboys. Uh, healthy Dak, Dak Prescott uh, is, the, is the linchpin of that. I, I've assumed, uh, thinking with the Cowboys, that I have with a lot of things that don't pan out for a long time. I believe the Cowboys are a NFC title contender after I see them be a legitimate NFC title contender. It's been that long. I don't want to get ahead on the bandwagon and be one of these reporters who repeatedly picks them to reemerge and watches them fall flat on their face. What's your thinking in the NFC that uh, that seems to be pretty wide open after Tampa Bay? Paul, I picked them to win the NFC East for a second year in a row last year. They lost it because Dak Prescott missed 11 games. When Prescott was playing, they were averaging 32 points a game. They're going to score points. They got Ezekiel Elliott. They got good receivers, good offensive line. If it can stay relatively healthy, what we don't know about the Cowboys is their defense. It's just like before anybody says they're a Super Bowl contender, they want to see that defense. Same as the Titans. People want to see a better, more consistent defense. But I think the Cowboys will win the division. I don't think Washington with Ryan Fitzpatrick and Taylor Haneke and uh, uh, Kyle Allen have the quarterbacks to to go to be a Super Bowl contender. And I know it's not going to be the Giants or the Eagles, so I think the Cowboys are going to run away with that division. John, uh, Jerry Jones knows how to make good investments. We, we've seen that with the team that he purchased and the Dallas Cowboys and what it's turned into. Why does he want to invest in the NFL Combine? Why does he want the Combine in Dallas so badly? And w- do, would you put Dallas at the top of your list for destinations when this thing goes to bid in 2023 over Vegas and over L.A.? Well, L.A. and Dallas are the ones that, of course, Vegas does. But they don't. They're, we're talk, They don't have what they need. The Cowboys facility, the Star, uh, which is a billion, costs more than the stadium. And I've been there in Frisco uh, three times, and it is perfect for what the NFL would need. At the combine, the only time you have to get in a car is when they take players to the hospital to get physicals. In Frisco, they've got a hospital right there in the complex. They got a big Omni Hotel right there in the complex. They have outdoor fields. They have an indoor stadium that would be perfect at that time of year because they can have ice storms. What they don't have is an opportunity for everybody to walk everywhere from their hotel to the facility, like in Indy. Then at night, everybody can walk to all their restaurants and bars afterward. And if it gets too cold or snows, they can use all the crossways on all the streets. Plus, it's centrally located. I've been to every combine since it went to Indy. I think I can't remember if it was 85 or 87. And L.A., does it's got a lot in that new complex, but it doesn't have all that. And, of course, you'd have to rent, everybody would have to rent cars in L.A. They'd have to rent cars in Dallas, and they'd have to rent cars in Vegas. So Jerry has been after it the longest. He wants it for two reasons. Number one, uh, to stroke his ego because Jerry loves things like that. He'd get a lot of attention. But number two, he'd find a way to make some money out of it. And we all know Jerry Jones loves making money. And it would be great publicity for Frisco. It would be great publicity. He has made off of the combine on average on an annual basis. Like what it's meant to the city and the publicity, not necessarily tourism, but the media they, they go there each year. All the coaches and teams end up in hotel rooms there. The league descends upon Indy. I wonder what that's worth value-wise annually. Well, it's enough of an economic impact for them to come back and bid to keep it because yeah. they get a lot of events there because they do such a fantastic job with those events. And it's just a destination place when you've got a big one, like it's a tournament or a championship or in this case, one of the NFL's uh, biggest events. And I think Indy will do everything it can for to put it up for bid 
you know, sounds sounds terrible, but that's what the NFL is all about. They're going to sell stakes in uh, NFL Network and NFL Radio, but they'll keep the power. And and I think this, uh, if they leave Indy, there will be a lot of people who will regret it, but it's only all those people who like to be able to walk everywhere. And the NFL doesn't give a rat, you know what, about people being able to walk instead of rent cars. And uh, it would be a huge Im- economic impact for where it is because you think about this, everybody in the NFL is there from every team and so many from the league office and so many media. And uh, those hotel rooms, man, if they didn't have if they didn't have the combine there for a week, a lot of restaurants, a lot of hotels, a lot of bars would lose a lot of money. Indianapolis Business Journal reported in 2019, that local hospitality officials estimated the city of Indianapolis generated 8.4 million and provided close to 10 million in media revenue from the combine. Not monstrous numbers. And I will say as big an event as it is, we've all been there a lot, John the most, there's still room for a cheerleader convention in in, uh, Indianapolis in the midst of that NFL combine every year, right? We see it, we see it in the hallways of the convention center. Yeah. John, yeah, I must point out that that's a cheerleader convention for little kids, not not uh, like college and, not, and NFL. Not like the ones that you were looking at in the movie. Uh, exactly. Yeah, and now the NCAA, uh, you can we John can sponsor them for NIL, which goes into effect today. John, thank you as always. Happy Fourth to you. Enjoy the long weekend. We will catch up soon. That sounds great, guys. Thank you very much for having me as always, and I hope you have a great Fourth too. Thanks. Thank you, John. Those numbers surprise me. They're, me too. They're low, and I, I and if you're bidding, to that's get what I'm it, saying. Like, and uh, if you're, yeah. So what's it worth to Indy to continue to bid up against Jerry Jones, who's going to outbid whoever steps to the plate? I mean, Jerry Jones would, would bid more than twenty million dollars, <laughs> which is so. more than those two numbers added together. Th- there's a report. We'll get to this coming up about what teams are worth right now versus what they're going to be worth by 2030, and they're, they're, to me, if you're investing in the combine coming to your city and it, all of these different things, if you're investing in NFL Network, uh, let's discuss the value of teams. Yeah, uh, I'm, the the I, sports betting and gambling that's going to be taking place, I'm kinda that will naive. be at the combine too. I'm kind of naive to how the gambling affects your bottom line. I mean, is it as simple as people are betting a ton at FanDuel, FanDuel is advertising through the league and it all circles back is it that simple as to how it adds value to your franchise and to your league we'll discuss on outkick 360 hang with us Outkick 360 across the Outkick Network. Glad you're with us today. What is sports gambling worth to the NFL? Uh, In reading Bleacher Report this morning, the headline reads this. NFL owners reportedly believe teams will eventually be worth eight to 10 billion with gambling coming into effect across the league. Uh, And this is through Pro Football Talk as well. Pro Football Talk is the one that mentions the 10 billion mark. Uh, the New England Patriots, for instance, according to Forbes, they are worth an estimated $4.4 billion. This is before you introduce the gambling aspect, the gaming aspect of everything. Um, Paul, this is percentage. To me, this is a percentage of uh, the, the contracts involved here uh, spread across the league. 
uh, from an NFL standpoint, but also individually stadium to stadium and what that means in your stadium. Not just for, uh, you mentioned Dallas, not just for Cowboys games, but imagine what you can do for any event in there. Combine, rodeo, literally anything you Concerts. want to bet on. Concerts. You, you go up to a, a booth and you can still bet on your sports. What? See, the booth thing I don't understand anymore because we've become very adept at betting on our phone. i got no interest in getting a line and waiting at a, at a, at a window yeah, but, 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 because I, I, what I need is superior oh, I, internet at I, those stadiums you're not to allow it. me to use FanDuel on my thing. Well, that's what you need to do. I'm not going to wait in the I, line. I'd, I'd just assume stay home and bet on my phone. Now, if you tell me I can go to the game and I'm going to have zero problem betting on my phone, that's the thing. That's the next level to me at all these stadiums. I know Nissan Stadium. They've worked on improving it, and it's gone from very bad to okay. But I need a, at a venue like Nissan Stadium with 68,000 for it to be at a level where everybody could be on their phone at the same time, checking their fantasy teams and their bets, right? And if you give me that, that enhances the experience. And I could check on our, our parlay from Jacob as often as I want. On uh, not from the press box internet, right? But on the stadium internet, get me to that level, and I don't need a window. I don't want a window because I'm turning my back would, on a bunch of stuff at the window. I would love a window at Bridgestone Arena where I tried to make a bet at FanDuel.com and could not do it while sitting at an Asheville Predators playoff game last month. But isn't it better to solve the internet problem and not create windows? Just solve the internet problem. Not if give you can make me more profit. Give well, give me the best internet possible there instead of renovating the place to create windows that will be at some point made well, moot when you solve the internet. Problem. But it's more than just the window. It is the overriding contract where the NFL has partnerships with DraftKings, with FanDuel, uh, and, and with other spots right. as well. Uh, to, they're going to get money from everyone. And these, uh, these massive companies are spending money before they're making money. Yeah, they're I would willing think to take FanDuel a loss. would come in and do the internet for you. I want to facilitate every way possible you sitting in your seat continuing to make bets. What's happening on this next series, you know, to whatever micro bets you can get down to. Uh, they, they want you on the internet as easily as possible. They don't want you thinking, oh, I got to get up and go miss this play that I want to bet on by going to the window. Caesars Entertainment is the other with, with the contract with the league. But this is this coincides with the 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 hundred billion dollar television contract as well that's spread across the league and that's shared. So uh, this is by 2030, they are estimated to be worth an estimated 10 billion if you're over four right now. That's how much we're seeing a rise in overall sports team value. This is there's a second reason that to me streaming internet quality is the maybe the biggest issue on this, that that we just discussed, and Amazon, which we've discussed, this Thursday night package, as the forefront of streaming games. And we've talked about how willing they are. They talk about Al Michaels. They've talked about Peyton Manning. They're clearly willing to spend to be a premier property. Yes. But what was the issue when a couple games were on Amazon last year? People were saying, I'm reading tweets about this game that are ahead of the game. So I'm watching the game on my TV on Amazon, and it's behind the real-time tweets I'm getting about the game. People are not going to be happy with that. Well, Amazon obviously has the money. They've got to get the tech caught up that a live stream is the same quality as a live telecast on CBS, NBC, ESPN. It's beyond that. It's beyond the stream that. now. I'm watching Direct TV last night. I'm watching the NBA game, and the final minute and a half, you could take you could you could take the Suns plus 21 and a half. Well, the problem was FanDuel, and they were up to the minute on this. To the They're second. never going to be behind. The score was 130 to 102. I'm watching live. I'm not watching on DVR. I'm watching live, and the score is 128 to 102. So they're behind. DirecTV was behind. Yeah. That's so a problem. It, that, that's, they are, even that extra second, that extra bucket factors into whether or not you want to take the 21 and a half over under in the final minute and a half. Yeah. So if you're a serious better, it's you do not want satellite. No. You, want, you want a me. Who's the fastest? Cable is the fastest. Uh, right FanDuel now. is the fastest. Uh, that's what it tells me. I don't, I don't care what you're watching. If they're at the game, they're getting it before you are. Right. 
at the game is the fastest. But if you're watching it somewhere, if you're watching it at a Vegas sports book, I presume they've got the fastest televised stuff, or maybe they got I guess. the slowest. <laughs> they want you to yeah, I, <laughs> they'll go stream. <laughs> but, but on the app, on the FanDuel app, I'm saying they're the fastest. Oh, yeah. I'm on my app, and I can see the score faster than what I'm watching it. Yeah. These that, are interesting elements to, to the whole thing. But so to, to get back to where I, I kind of teased that whole thing, is the money simply that circular? You're betting on the game. And so these betting entities want to lure you to bet more on the game and lure more people to bet on the game. So they're investing in sponsorships uh, with, with the teams and the leagues, and that money adds, therefore adds value to the price of these teams and these leagues and the TV contracts, and round and round it goes. It's, just, it's that simple as to why these valuations of the teams and the leagues are on the up. From, Coming up from the betting is that is, is yeah, that no, simple? I agree. Yeah, it's it's everything involved, but it's it's just the the ability to make money off of it now, and it's doubling the overall profit of. But the, me betting on the Browns to win this weekend yeah. isn't doing anything for the Browns. It's doing something for Fanduel, and Fanduel's doing something for the Browns. Yes, yeah, for that opportunity to partner with the league as the exclusive provider. That's, that's how I view it, um, and that equals a ton of money because sports fans want the ability to bet on their favorite team, right? Yep. Because a lot of people bet emotionally. Their Raise favorite my hand team here. Or, or any team. I'm convinced that it's going a certain way, and nine times out of ten, I should have gone with Jakob Swanson. We, we have his parlay. He won last night, by the way. His J- Jacob hit is on the parlay. We have, <laughs> we have details on where you should bet and why tonight. Jacob will give you his 360 parlay. Also coming up, big trade in the NHL involving the Nashville Predators and Victor Arvidsson will tell you where RV is headed and why. And Reed's dog laments. We have Mississippi State as the baseball champion. They wear the crown in college baseball over Vanderbilt, winning the last two games in blowout fashion. Plus, there is a Tennessee volunteer that's first to jump into the mix for name, image, likeness. And Chad Withrow is also involved in an event that includes this player. We'll discuss that straight ahead on Outkick 360.
Outkick 360 across the Outkick network. Tennessee Power Hour is here coming up in about 10 minutes. We'll talk with Chris Lee of VandySports.com. We'll recap the College World Series matchup last night where Vanderbilt uh, blown out yet again. Uh, nearly no hit. A combined no hitter never taken place in the College World Series. And Mississippi State nearly pulled it off where Vandy got a hit in the eighth um, that, that ended that run. What an incredible run for Mississippi State. And Vanderbilt uh, loses in the final game of the, of the season um, and finishes with 49 wins. Nothing to uh, shake her head out and be disappointed about from the youth aspect of this team. They'll be back. But an opportunity missed by the squad after winning game one and needing one more victory to hoist the trophy in a year where they advanced on a wild pitch and they advanced due to COVID in NC State. And, uh, I mean, you had to wonder how a team as talented as that hit so little and fielded so poorly. <clears throat> really disappointing. And, and look, you can understand the hitting. Team, teams go quiet. Uh, you know, teams slump. Teams run into good pitching. They, they're excellent pitching for, for Mississippi State uh, yesterday and in the final two games. But to field the way they did or didn't, um, fielding slumps are not really a thing. And it, it really felt like, I don't know if they pressed or how they got away from the basics the way they did. I'm looking forward to Chris Lee's uh, information on how they got so far away. Yeah. If you're going to win a College World Series, you're going to have to field well, plus, uh, you know, and, and they didn't. Uh, and I, I was really, uh, listen, I'm not uh, following them religiously by any means, but I turn on a Vanderbilt baseball team at this time of year, uh, I expect it to, to be making plus plays, like the play we saw on Monday night. Uh, with Vaz coming 150 feet from right field to slide and make a play near the wall, not to see the second baseman yesterday just having a ball go off the heel of his glove, and inexplicably he's kind of shaking his head and being like, I can't believe that I did not make that play. And that's what anybody who's rooting for Vanderbilt last night is thinking on multiple plays. Like, how are they failing to make, you know, Simon's coach says, make the routine play. And Vanderbilt was not making some routine plays um, last night. That was the main disappointment. Now, they weren't winning that game if they made the routine play last night. But I would have felt a lot better of them if they had gone out at least making the routine play. Coming up, Chris Lee, VandySports.com. Big headline in Nashville today. The Nashville Predators trading Victor Arvidsson to the Los Angeles Kings in exchange for two draft picks. Those draft picks, a 2021 second-round pick. So they get a pick this year and then a third round pick next year. Victor Arvidsson uh, is one of those fan favorites and for good reason because of, his hustle, because of his hustle and effort. And look, the problem here is scraps. twofold. Um, what's that? He scraps. Yeah, uh, he's a very good player. Um, the, the problem here is twofold. Number one, he has not been the same player to meet the expectations that we have for him over the last two years because he's been injured. And you just ended a playoff run uh, albeit a short one, where he didn't play because he was injured. And you wonder if he's going to be at the same level and play at that same level as what we've seen in years past. They were able to move out salary, and they were able to move a player that, again, did not help them in the postseason, and they get two picks in return because they didn't have a lot of young talent on this roster right now anyway. Uh, and now they get to add to their overall pool of players that has been depleted during past seasons because of trade deadline acquisitions and trade deadline deals where you send some picks in return. Um, it sounds like Ellie Tolvanen is one of those guys that will be asked to step up and fill that role. He has a long way to go to do that. Um, this was, you know, one of the fan favorites, great personality, um, a core guy. But here's the harsh reality, and what I have said, and Paul can vouch for this, what I've said for years. At some point, you have to look at the core and wonder, is this core good enough? Or do we have to shake up and change the core pieces in order to make a run? And this is one of those moves, and I, I brought Arvidsson up as an example. Was Poyle, David Poyle willing to make a difficult decision, a difficult trade, based on trade value? And there are some players that 
I think they, they may look at and hope that the Kraken end up acquiring, like Duchesne. Do you leave him protected or leave him unprotected? That's that's a question. Or do you make a deal we'll learn soon. for them to take him? Uh, either way, you're begging for him to take take on Duchesne because he hasn't been the player that you acquired or that you signed, right? Uh, in this case, Arvidsson met those expectations when he was healthy. The problem is he hasn't been. The Kings are betting on he will be, and the Predators needed to change up the core pieces in order to take a next step. I think it goes beyond the health too. I think the injuries have added up to him slowing down. And speed, uh, his, his ability to, to use that. He's a small guy, but fast, right? And I think the, cumul uh, the accumulation of the injuries has led to on the occasions where he is healthy, he doesn't have, or he's not entirely healthy, he doesn't move as quickly as he used to. He's, he's getting older. He's due $4.25 million this year. That's he's not a... $4.25 right. million dollar player They're able anymore. to move that you're, salary. You're paying him for what he was, not for what well, he's going to be. Seems like a good deal to me. Uh, you've got to start getting the draft picks and re replenishing the, the system. Well, they also now, Paul, have, uh, you know, th this, is a, this can also be a shrewd move to move Duchesne. You can incentivize, incentivize the, the, the Seattle Kraken to take on Duchesne and use one of these picks you've acquired to, give to help move and make that. Yeah. To that. And yeah. then you're dumping an even bigger salary and putting yourself in a much better financial position. We'd be remiss if we didn't offer our condolences to Lindsay and David Reed, who <laughs> That's right. uh, got a puppy. Uh, how old is he, Reed? Reed's it behind. Four or five years old, maybe. How old is Harvey? three-year-old dog in their house who they named after RV. Uh, they have a picture of RV with RV. They snuck him into a, a cell phone store when he was making an appearance. And today the two part and one will be in Nashville and one will be in the City of Angels. Um, I think they got a good run out of the relationship. But nevertheless, they're going to have to have a tough conversation with their dog tonight about his namesake uh, departing. Now, he's from Europe, so he's not been here year-round, so they're used to some separation. But now, it's a year-round separation, except when the Kings come to, to Nashville. And I hope I never have to have a conversation like this with Ripley, and I won't because he's not named after anybody specific. Unless you want to take him to a Ripley's, believe it or not, museum, and then the conversation gets awkward <laughs> with some of the stuff he'll find. You know, there, there is a believe it or not element to this. Like, can you believe it or not that I actually went in for the second dog? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Others can. Um, uh, final thing, uh, just thinking about Arvids, and I think about the Jofa line and what that group has meant to this Predators team and the core of pieces. Of this era. Yeah, uh, 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 of the, the Pecorine run and, and, and what he's meant to everything. The Jofa line, though, keep in mind, has not been able to stay together over the last two seasons due to injuries. Like, that's that's... Also a harsh it's reality been taped in this. together when it's been uh, But Arvidsson's going to go down, not just as a fan favorite, but one of the best to put on the, the Preds colors. Very I mean, influential player. And, yeah. And people will remember him fondly, and they should. And they should. And they need, like you're saying, if it's Tolvanen or whomever, there's a big role to be filled there. Unfortunately, Arvidsson himself hasn't been filling it, and that's the reason they're making this deal. 25 points in 50 games uh, this past season, and again, did not help them at all in the postseason. Coming up, speaking of postseason, it's over for college baseball. Mississippi State wins the championship. Vanderbilt takes it to game three in a winner-take-all scenario, but wasn't able to take anything at the plate and gave up some runs due to some errors in the field. We discussed that with Chris Lee of VandySports.com next on the Tennessee Power Hour.
Outkick 360, the Tennessee Power Hour rolls on across the Outkick Network alongside Paul Koharski. I'm Jonathan Hutton. Pleased to be joined by Chris Lee of VandySports.com. You can follow him on Twitter at ChrisLee70. Uh, the Commodores lose in Game 3 of the College World Series last night. Mississippi State takes home their first team championship uh, and hoists the trophy at TD Ameritrade Park. They do that in blowout fashion on back-to-back -back nights. Chris, hope you're doing well. Really enjoyed your coverage at VandySports.com throughout uh, the, the College World Series and throughout the calendar year, or the sports calendar year for Vandy. Are you, are you more surprised at the lack of production at the plate over the last two nights or the errors in the field for Vanderbilt? I think the errors, uh, one thing to always tell people, if you don't watch college baseball, don't watch in February and March. Watch in May and June when teams are clicking on all cylinders. And I don't think that any program or coach has figured that out more than Tim Corbin. And so to see them go to Omaha and defend the way they did was a little bit alarming because they usually lock it down on defense more than any team out there. And so to see them lose games – well, I won't say that lost in games necessarily. The bats factor, too, as you mentioned. But to see them perform the way that they did uh, was unusual. I've, I've covered a lot of Tim Corbin teams, and I've never seen one that got worse in that regard as the season ended, but that's kind of the way it happened. What did Corbin say uh, about the decay of, of the defense as things went along? Well... He didn't say a lot, and one thing that was interesting last night, we had asked him questions about particular players in health, and I'm sure he was not talking about it because it's probably a little bit of a competitive advantage, but after the series was over, he mentioned that Carter Young was about a 5 or a 6 on a scale of 1 to 10. Carter just locked it down defensively all year, and then about five, six weeks ago, he steals a base in a midweek game. His shoulder comes out of socket, and he comes back a couple weeks later. Well, I don't know the severity of his shoulder injury compared to others, but you look up that injury, and that's the kind of thing that sidelines major league players for two or three months sometimes. So when he came back, he just wasn't the same guy at the plate. He wasn't the same guy in the field. I think he was the guy that was – I guess under the gun or in the crosshairs a good bit in terms of errors because he's a shortstop, but he was phenomenal uh, in getting mentioned as a first rounder for next year, a lot because of the defense. Now they had other issues too. They never fielded well at third all year. Dominic Keegan at first was a little bit erratic. And, and frankly, you can put blame a lot of places. I don't think that other than maybe Enrique Bradfield and Javier Vaz, anybody was great in the field in Omaha. So it wasn't just on Carter Young, but he was kind of the one who was the focus of a lot of that attention because his defense all year had been so good until Omaha. Um, and it was alarming to see, but I think there was a little bit of an explanation. Plus, this is a team that, frankly, I don't think was used to playing baseball that deep into the season. Uh, not to make excuses, Mississippi State just beat them. And if they played this series again, I think would win for all the reasons we saw. But – this was a team that didn't have any of its lineup playing in Omaha two years ago when they won it. And I think inexperience and just the grind of baseball. I mean, they've been going for five months straight. It just seemed like they wore down at the end. Uh, and maybe that explains some of it, too. Chris Lee with VandySports.com, our guest on Outkick 360. Chris, uh, I was not able to join in on the Zoom press conference last night, but you were. And you say this was Tim Corbin at his very best because of the big picture outlook and how he was able to put everything into perspective. Why was he at his best? Take us inside that presser and, and what struck you? Well, I, I think he was gracious. Uh, Tim is not always a guy who's taken losing easily, but it, I think he did a lot to give credit where it was due on the other side. I think he was able to open up a little bit about their situation and be more honest with us than he's been in terms of guys being banged up. That was good to know. It confirmed some things that I suspected, but it never heard him really say out loud. Um, I, I thought he handled it well. I think that he obviously was hurting that they didn't win the whole thing, but his sense of perspective, I thought on the whole season, was good. He talked about how tough it is to win that event. I agree with him. And I think really when 
he was asked about Kumar Rocker. I saw something from him I, I'd never seen before. He had to pause about 15 seconds before we answered the question because you could tell he was choked up. And you could really tell how much that kid meant to him in that program. And I thought that was kind of neat to see. I thought that was a, a cool moment um, for just everybody to get a glimpse of how close he was to him and what he meant to the team. I just thought that the transparency last night all the way around and the way that he spoke of his team and what they had to do and what Mississippi State did just painted a picture of what it's like out there, how tough it is, how tough it is to win a title. Um, I don't think that I've really done it justice. You kind of have to see it for yourself. But I've, I've been through hundreds of those with him, and I've never seen him quite like that in one of those. What did you make, Chris, of the of the approach to game two and the bullpen and saving the best pitching even after Rocker for game three and what we saw last night? Do, do you think there's any hesitation looking back on that decision not to go to the pin quicker in game two and try to keep that game closer than what it was instead of living for game three because you already had a game at hand? No, that was the right call. Uh, they have about five arms that they can trust right now, uh, one of whom – well, two of whom didn't pitch very well last night. Once they got behind and weren't hitting – I mean, your hope going into that game if you're Vanderbilt – is that Christian Little could have bottled what he did in Hoover, which he didn't do, mm -hmm. and his defense, again, didn't help him. Patrick Riley behind him has been good at times and not so good at other times. So you're flipping a coin going, maybe you can get a good performance out of Riley. That didn't happen. I thought as soon as it went bad and they got down four or five runs, I'm thinking, you've got a pretty good shot throwing Rocker on another day's rest. Uh, he was more rested than Will Bednar at Mississippi State. You get to save all your arms. You get to maybe bring Nick Maldonado back after him throwing Monday. I thought it was the right approach. It just didn't work out. We know what Rocker has meant to, to this team, to that program, what he meant in 2019 as a freshman and what he did on the mound in that moment and all the great performances in between. How do you describe what Rocker, what, what he meant to the Vanderbilt baseball program, how he will be remembered, and put in perspective for us, if you will, what Corbin is thinking, and we're guessing here, but he's holding emotions back as he pauses for 15 seconds. Is he viewing him as the greatest player to put on the Vandy boys uniform, in a way? I think he might. I think he's got a case. Um, I, I'd have to look at it, but I think he's got a really good case. Uh, and especially if you consider if 2020 goes through, right? I think he's going to have another dominant season. You're looking at three All-American type years or maybe maybe two All-American type years and a College World Series MVP and another. So there's that. Um, you know, I watch pitchers in the league a lot, and you see a lot of kids who come to SEC ball who were first, second-round level picks who come in in the first year they struggle. And what Tim said last night was dead on. You don't do what he does as a freshman, and you will see it here in a couple of weeks. You'll see some college kids who were picked in the first round or two, and you'll go back and look at what they did as freshmen and sometimes sophomores, and you'll see maybe a five or a six ERA in there in a lot of cases. It's really difficult to come in and not just pitch as well as he did, but don't forget – he saved their season a couple times in 2019. They get beat, what was it, 18-5 to by Duke in a Super Regional. He comes back the next night in a game where they lose their going home, and he pitches a no-hitter. And then he pitches two good starts in Omaha and gets College World Series MVP. That's not something you see a lot out of sophomores and juniors, and you sure don't see it as freshmen. And I think that's just what made him so special, the way that he was able to come in and be dominant right away. And it's a shame. I would have loved to have seen how 2020 played out because I think he would have accumulated a stat line and just a body of work that we're probably sitting here today saying, yeah, he's the greatest that ever wore that uniform. He didn't get most of that season, so he didn't get to really accumulate a lot of those numbers. It is what it is, but I think Tim summed it up really well after the game last night. Chris Lee of southeastern14.com and vandysports.com with us. You can find him on Twitter at Chris Lee 70 How's this team stand for next year? Obviously, everybody's going to pay the most attention to Rocker and Lighter. 
getting drafted and going to the next level. Um, but, but what's left behind, what's coming in, and what are going to be reasonable expectations um, for, for a team that, that now everybody's going to kind of come to expect to, to make a World Series charge annually? I think they'll be good. Whether they'll be great is the question. Uh, this will probably surprise people based on the way they hit in Omaha, but I think they can get some kids healthy and get the normal freshman to sophomore, sophomore to junior jump out of that lineup. I think they've got a chance to be one of the best hitting lineups in the country next year. The draft's going to be important. I think uh, Dominic Keegan and C.J. Rodriguez are kids who could get drafted, say, in the first four or five rounds, or maybe not. Um, Maybe – they come back, maybe they don't. I mean, you look back at the 2019 team, one thing that really helped them is they had some kids like Ethan Paul and Julian Infante and Stephen Scott who'd hit pretty well, who came back when they didn't get picked where they wanted. I think that's one thing to watch. I think they'll be good either way on offense, but I think they can really be great depending on the draft. And that also will include some high school kids. I think pitching-wise – they're talented. I mean, they've got a lot of kids who throw 90s, a lot of kids who throw mid-90s, but there's a big jump between that and pitching effectively, which, again, is what made Rocker so special. What I'm looking to see is can those arms take a jump? Can the Patrick Rileys and the Christian Littles go from guys who were were good half the time to guys who are SEC-level starters and, and can give you six, seven, eight consistent good innings on the weekends. I think if those pitchers step up, they got a chance to get back there, but there's certainly going to be a lot of ifs with that club. Um, it's not an automatic reload into Omaha because you still got a lot of guys who need to prove some things. Chris, today the the start date for name image likeness across college sports, there will be some programs that will jump right into this, some that will be a wait and see and take a wait and see approach. We know that Tennessee has has a player and Cade Mays already who's who's announcing that he's doing some things with an agency. Have you heard anything like this from from Vanderbilt Athletics and what's your sense of how they approach this overall because as we know this will be used as a big tool in recruiting. To be honest, I've been so tied in with the College World Series, I haven't checked around on that. Uh, my question is how many players do they have that are marketable right now outside of baseball? I, I don't find a lot. Maybe you've got one in Ken Seals, your quarterback. Uh, but when you, your football team goes 0-9, that, that's a little bit hard <laughs> to market. Um, basketball, they would probably have one in Scotty Pippen Jr. Mm-hmm. I suspect he's going pro and won't be back. And, and that roster next year is just a bunch of names that nobody knows. It's freshmen and transfers. So, t- to me, the, the team that finished playing last night is the one that's got the most marketable kids – at that school, uh, but those kids have been pretty tied up with baseball. I think that's probably been the last thing on their mind. But in my mind, if you've got somebody that's worth an endorsement deal, it's Enrique Bradfield Jr. or, or any number, uh, I guess you'll see Lighter and Rocker go. So they won't be Vanderbilt athletes here in a couple of weeks. But to me, all the marketable guys were guys you saw on that team last night. Chris, did you get any sense that the, the way the weekend played out for the Commodores played a factor in anything that they did this week once they made it to the final series, that the, the way that the NC State stuff went down over the weekend. Was there a, a mental lapse or, or a, a lack of energy or something there? We know they won game one. Lighter was mm-hmm. very good. Uh, they hit the ball, and they hit it well right out of the gate. Um, so maybe we can't just point to that instance, but it, do you think there was any lingering effect from what happened on Saturday morning? Well, I think the short answer is they were just going to get beat, right? Okay. I think you look at how that series played out. Um, you had to have Rocker and Lighter both throw well. You had no margin for error otherwise. You got one out of two, and, and I think the better team won. Now, I will say this. You carry a lot of weight being a Vanderbilt player, And just wearing that name on your jersey breeds a lot of expectations, which isn't necessarily fair to some of those kids because they haven't been a part of those title teams. They didn't get a season last year to get experience. So they got thrown to the fire right off. And you look at the background where they come into this, right? You've always got the the stuff about the Whistler, and a lot of people hate them for that. You've got 
all sorts of things. Um, you've got the scholarship thing, and nobody's fan base gripes about that more than Mississippi State's. So that was a full-throated conversation the whole time. You've got on top of that, you have um, – you know, the NC State thing, which was beyond their control, and a lot of stuff was thrown out there. I thought it was unfair, uh, but it is what it is. I think you throw all those things together. Those kids are under a lot of pressure being on that stage for the first time. Again, they were going to lose anyway, but you look in the dugout at certain points in Omaha, and they just look beat. I'll give you an example. The Stanford game, I went to the kitchen to, to grab a snack, and I'm just sitting there thinking – how do I tie in the story of the night with the story of the season that they just got worn out and exhausted and, and the moment was too big? And, and then I, I come back in, and, and 10 pitches later, they win the game before you can even blink. And I'm like, well, maybe it's not what we think it is. But I, I kept looking into that dugout when they showed it on TV and seeing tired eyes and tired body language. And in the end, I just think the, the length of the season – the way of the moment, all kinds of things were just too much for them. And Mississippi State is a hard team to not like watching them play in the series, right? Yeah. I mean, it, no matter who you're rooting for, you felt good for them uh, and, and the dog pile at the end of that game last night. Yeah, they had a lot of things. They have personality, first of all. You know, the Landon Sims is the Tanner Islands. They strike me from afar as, as pretty good kids and pretty good representatives for that school. And you've got Rowdy Jordan and Tanner Allen, who are just, I don't know if they had a baseball Mount Rushmore for that school. You got a lot of faces that could go on there. Will Clark and Rafael Palmeira being maybe the biggest two, but those guys never won a title. And mm. Jordan and Allen were kids who started for them in Omaha uh, in 2018 and 2019. You got Landon Sims, their ace reliever, who would have been the best reliever in college baseball if not for Kevin Copps. You got Will Bedner, who's a first-rounder, who threw great last night. Um, that was a likable team in my mind. Um, you know, you're happy for those kids, certainly, to see them win it. And that's a fan base that, the, you know, the title, speaking of carrying weight around, the, the title, the best program without a national title, is a lot for people to carry. And I think that team bore the burden of a lot of expectation and hope. And that's a tough one to wear, too. But I thought they did it with class and, and with style and a lot of success. And hats off to them for doing that. You can follow Chris on Twitter at ChrisLee70VandySports.com. Chris, uh, get some rest, man. You've, you've got uh, a little bit of time here before camp and before college football kicks off uh, and what will be a, a crazy year, to say the least, uh, with packed stadiums again, at least we hope. That, that That's where we're trending and what's been announced. Uh, that's what I'm expecting. And then, of course, the name, image, likeness, and, and the free-for-all there, which is going to be fun to follow no matter if you're for or against because we have no idea what to expect in that regard. Yeah, there's not much of an off season for us anymore, especially yeah. with baseball getting to be a bigger thing. That's that's set of us on a lot of beats. But um, yeah, it's time to recharge the batteries between now and fall camp, and it'll be here before we know it. Hey, great perspective today. We we appreciate, we appreciate the time. It. You bet. Thank you. All right, Chris Lee, there, VandySports.com, the website with great analysis and uh, insight on Vanderbilt season, uh, but beyond that, gearing up for the college football season and the SEC slate. I, I think there is there is value on some Vanderbilt football players uh, locally. And, Paul, just because they're one of 14, they are one of 14 SEC schools, that carries some value in and of itself. Maybe not what Alabama <laughs> – what Alabama is going to pull at the quarterback or running back or defensive line position. I know it's asking a lot. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I wonder if you could like dream up an example for Vandy, non-quarterback, uh, coming off 0-9. I, I think Clark Lee could probably, uh, but though that's not going to be, you know, on the front of his desk with all that he's got to deal with football-wise. I'm sure Clark Lee has people because he's hired very yeah. intelligently. Um, Barton Simmons would be one of them. Yeah. Right. But I, uh, yeah, it's part of a recruiting pitch. Yeah. Certainly. But um, you know, I well, think you just need a donor to schools, step in. Yeah, some schools <laughs> uh, would be s s slower than others. I'm very yeah. curious what Vanderbilt will will do with it too. It's kind of a seems like in some circumstances a hurry up and wait. 
kind of uh, environment. In some cases, in, you know, and in other cases, it, it can be to hurry up and hurry. <laughs> yeah, uh, player by player, right? Like um, we're we're seeing at Miami, at Florida State, Mike Norvell at Florida State. They've they've already said like Florida's. They've made it clear, the state of Florida, NIL and what the state regulations are, the really none, come join us. You know, be a quarterback in the state of Florida, be a running back, a wide receiver in the state of Florida, stay in the state of Florida. Uh, it's a huge recruiting pitch for them. At Tennessee, we're seeing where Cade Mays is teaming up with a local agency, um, where Chad's going to MC an event next week in Knoxville, Old City Sports Bar, where we, we held our orange and white pregame party, our tailgate party, uh, great venue, and it's just a Q&A to learn more about name, image, likeness, and how you can profit as an athlete, or uh, you know how universities can help in that regard. If you're a fan and you're interested in just learning what it's like, or a potential sponsor, you can go there and learn it. I mean, it's crazy to think that's where we are, and today's day one of that. We've talked about this for years from an NFL perspective. The, the NFL brotherhood, right? Everybody wants their guys to make money, yeah. right? Yep. Uh, I did, uh, I think it was when I, sh I was a stringer for Sports Illustrated, and they had a year where they had guys play video game head-to-head, -head, uh, and Bullock played somebody. So I went to Bullock's place, and I wrote the Bullock side of a you know small little thing yeah. about him playing somebody. I can't even remember who it was. <clears throat> but I always remember the the salutation with those two guys was symbolic of what the league was right stay healthy and go get yours right and those were good then they were good for the generation before them they're good for the generation now right that's what guys wish for each other stay healthy i don't want any to see any anybody get hurt and go get yours it's a short career we want you to make every penny you can and you want me to make every penny i can it's good for everybody right I wonder, and we're going to talk about all kinds of permutations of this whole thing. I'm sure that there's a general feeling of go get yours, right? But are we going to have the haves and have nots here? On um, not a Alabama, probably it, it's taken Maybe. care of, right? But on a, a, yeah. a more middling Power Five program, what's the jealousy factor going to be for the? very good offensive lineman who's anonymous and the quarterback who is reeling something in and getting himself not just money but the profile that comes with the, doing the things that earn you the money are you thinking hey that's great yeah Hutton, i'm really happy for you buy me a burger yeah. or you're, the beer's well, on you tonight or am i thinking we're on the same team pulling the same rope coach is talking about all those things and here I am still scrounging, calling home for some extra money, and here you are. I'm the guy blocking for you, making sure you're not on your ass, and you're living a pretty different life than I'm living now. I See, the quarterback normally always takes care of his offensive line. Right, but this is a new dynamic now. The quarterback um, hasn't had a chance to take care of the offensive line before. Does he learn that yeah. automatically? These are some new dynamics. And not I, necessarily a quarterback, the running back, sure. the receiver. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you, you tend to take care of, of the guys that are working up front for you. Yeah, and how much you're making? Are you making enough? That, and what's taken care of? You know, there are all these yeah. permutations to well, it. Well, you mentioned the video game. I can totally see where players, uh, athletes, or, you know, a kid pays to play against, you know, one of the star athletes at a school, you know, online. Like, that. that's wide open now. Uh, pay for a tweet. For instance, it's not just – think about the – Give me a shout-out takes a new meaning. A shout-out. Yeah. Guys walk by, guys in the locker yeah. room, they always say, shout me out. Yeah. Well, now shout me out has a, a, a value to it potentially. Yeah, but think about like – so I, I think the, the initial thought is, oh, the quarterbacks and the running back, the stars, the, the skill position is going to make a ton. Sackers. Cade Mays. Offensive lineman Cade Mays is the first player from the University of Tennessee that's announced he's partnering with Spire Sports Group which is a sports agency and a marketing firm, a creative agency in Knoxville. Offensive lineman has announced that right out of the gate on day one. So if that's the case, and we're seeing it from, from other players across the country. There's a player at Illinois, I believe. Maybe it's Iowa. I can't remember what I was reading last night. Right at midnight it was announced. Uh, at 1220 Eastern it was announced that 
uh, Miami and Florida State's quarterbacks, uh, Derek King and Mackenzie Milton, were teaming up with their own agency for NIL. I mean, so who's to say that an offensive, uh, an offensive lineman and a defensive back can't team up from opposing teams and actually create something within their own conference? That. I, I am fascinated just to know how far we'll go and how fast we'll go. Now here's another interesting at the same angle. Time. I sent you this earlier from Tom Palacero. Yes. The NFL Players Association advised agents they're permitted to enter, enter into NIL marketing agreements with college players, a potential game changer in recruiting, though the union says such agreements should, should not, should not, not may not, should not, very important word choice, include clauses about future NFL representation. Well, what the hell am I getting involved in a college NIL agreement with a guy for, which might be significant, but is relatively small potatoes and I, compared to a contract I'm going to get a top 10 draft pick and ultimately get a top 10 draft pick in his second contract. If I'm an NFL agent, that's what I'm going for, right? I'm trying to ultimately get to a second contract with a big-time pick. That's where my, I'm making my big money. So if I'm starting with the NIL relationship with you, ultimately what do I want? The long-term contract and the, the relationship. So why am I starting that relationship if it should not include anything about future NFL? Well, they have to say that. But, I mean, uh, if they, it, they have no control over but that. But this is begging that, for that, dirty. That sports agency... Uh, can go and recruit the high school athlete. i say, screw your rules about college athletes. I'll go recruit them in high school because the NCAA is allowing that to happen. So this changes the agent game and lending itself to be, yeah. uh, I, I want to say dirty, old school dirty, but we know plenty of these agents are shysters <laughs> who are yeah. going to take these kids Some as long yeah. as they're good or profitable and drop them as soon as they're not, which is free market, yes, but also is going to leave some kids in the gutter. And I'm using that only partially figuratively. Yeah. And I, I think we will eventually see some, some players that do feature that. I'm, I'm trying... I, I, this is not just about sports, though. This is about social media following and influencer. You know, the, the social media influencer category. I mean, there, there are so many athletes right now in college sports. I'm not talking foot. I think a lot of people think big sports. Foot, but the money makers in college. Football, basketball. Beyond that, the, non-profit, the non-profitable sports in collegiate athletics, they feature some athletes that have a ton of influence and millions of followers on social media. That's where, like, if imagine the the gymnast at LSU. Imagine if she charges a dollar per follower if you want to sponsor her for a post on Instagram or a, a series of posts on Instagram over a year. If she charges a dollar, she's gonna make it a million bucks, you know, on one contract. Darren Ravel, uh, uh, who, who's following the money in sports, is saying it. We're, we're low-balling a lot of these athletes if we think this is about a couple thousand dollars. He's adding zeros to that discussion uh, for a lot of them. It, it, it's more than just a game changer. This is changing the landscape of college sports. And it's more than just, oh, here's a hundred dollars. Will you show up and take a photo with this car dealership? Here's a thousand dollars. Will you schedule a series of tweets uh, posing with uh, a Coca-Cola bottle. I mean, it's much larger than just one tweet or one Facebook post. I think you hit on something here, and we're going to have all these avenues that we're going to go back yeah. to and go and guests more thoroughly. And, yeah. um, the media element of it. You know, Rovell's job is really to follow the money. He's with the Action, mm-hmm. Action Network now. If I'm in a major media outlet, I'm creating a beat for this right now. It's not just my sports business person because this would overwhelm my sports business person. I, I got somebody right now with a strict focus on this, the growth of it, all these avenues that we've hit on. We've hit on 10 today just with small mentions. But uh, you need a beat writer on NIL right now, a sports business person focused on strictly on NIL. Yeah, I mean, who's uh, why not have – I mean – and I know OutKick has thought about this. Barstool has tweeted about this. Why not have 
a pay for podcast for college athletes. You can do that now where they're exclusive to your site and you have a weekly podcast. It's a player show, much like a coach would get paid in his contract for a coach's show. You have a player show on your podcast network. But you also need a colander, right? A sift. Yeah. Because every athlete's going to think this is him or her. But you got to sift through it because there's going to be a lot of crap in there. There's going to be a lot of gold in there, too. But you got to sift through a lot. A lot of it is going to be bad sure. uh, in terms of the podcast conversation. I mean, we've talked to a lot of athletes. A lot of them have nothing to say. Then when you get down to the the, but the gymnast, ones that do will make their money. Oh, yeah. The ones that are good will be... It'll be a fantastic listen. But it's like the podcast universe. How many podcasts are out there and how many podcasts are out there that are really good? Well, and that's determined, that sift is determined by the consumer. Yeah. And the clicks. But at the beginning, when you're overwhelmed by a billion podcasts, mm -hmm. who's doing the sifting? Uh, the market does, but it's going to take some time. Because if there are a million new podcasts... It's, well, it's a way that's, to that's whittle it down saying. to the hundred that the are good. The sift is taking place by the visual aspect that you can have an influencer in college sports now that's not even in football or basketball that has 3.4 million TikTok followers. I mean, that, that exists. And now you can go and specifically target that demographic, if you so choose. Yes. Um, and I'm if interested. You, if I don't want to be part of the sifting. I, I want the, the final. When it gets down to the hundred, I'll I'll scan through the hundred. I don't want to be part of scanning through the million. Well, but the the big corporations will take over those hundred. Yes, absolutely. You know, absolutely. And then and then and those hundred are going to be. And then you decide, okay, fantastic. Okay, do I want the uh, Josh Reynolds, Titans wide receivers doing an autograph signing, where they're charging like eight dollars for verification of his autograph? this weekend or next weekend. Um, Just eight? Eight dollars for the certification, like the, the verification that he was physically there. Uh, <laughs> then it's like $25 per item after that or something. But I'm thinking, okay, are, are, is that agency going to pay Josh Reynolds now as the third wide receiver on the Titans roster? Or are they going to the University of Tennessee to target Knoxville instead of Nashville? Like, that, that's been off the table until now. Right. I'm just curious how you what approach that, yeah. what the demand is for the player and, that's and, not been able to do it. And then you're on these scales, like, I'm curious about the fandom. You know, you might be more passionate about the University of Tennessee. Yeah. But the Titans are going to be far better than the Vols are. Yeah, but the agency's year, going right? to bet on the player becoming a draft pick and that autograph meaning something down the down road. Down the line. That's the what, fan right that's now. That's the investment. Right. That's the investment for them long term. The fan right now, though, do you want UT's top receiver right now? Are you projecting that? Are you projecting Josh Reynolds might play in the Super Bowl this year? Uh, you know, all, all these things. We've got all kinds of scales and levers and stuff like we've been talking about. Is it going to be a font for But us? as we know, the college fan, much more loyal. Yes. Passion. To their rooting interest. You say, I get this guy at the ground level. It's also like buying a stock. You know, the Josh Reynolds is a little bit of a stock because he's new, too. And, uh, and while, while there are some passionate NFL fan bases, if we're just going to keep the, the discussion strictly to football, there are some passionate NFL fan bases. There are weeks and moods for college football fans that are determined by the result on Saturday. Like, if you win on Saturday, your week's going to be pretty good at work. And if you lose, you're going to be in misery until they kick off again. Does the fantasy weekend. come into play here some way? Is some in, in a way that it hasn't before, was NIL For a factor in, in college not having fantasy, or is it just because there are too many teams? Like if you did a uh, an all college I don't, fantasy, or would a SEC fantasy league be more interesting to people? That's not national enough. It's not broad enough the way the NFL is. That's I'm intrigued by that. I don't know. Let's see. There, there's another avenue to this. Um, <laughs> the NCAA is not policing any of it. Because that's another thing. I They're think leaving it up people, to the university. Pulls people to an NFL guy, right? You're on my fantasy team. Yeah, so you I keep up with them. Guy. Yeah. Um, but how many? How how is the NFL player profiting off of fantasy football? Oh, he's not. He's taking abuse for it. More, <laughs> he's more than taking anything, up right? But it does being lift his trash. Name. It does lift his name. Oh yeah, you're, it, you're, his brand you're grows. About him his the, his brand grows. Coming up. Uh, let's let's discuss the brand of an NFL safety in Kevin Byard 
and the decision of how he was deployed within the Titans' defense last season compared to how he should be used moving forward. Paul wrote about this. We'll break it down next on OutKick 360. Masters is all about a great time for a great cause. Every three minutes across the United States, someone is diagnosed with a blood cancer. And our efforts are to put a stop to that through raising funds all to benefit the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And specifically tonight, for the state of Tennessee, Outkick 360 is here, Outkick the coverage is here, and plenty of sponsors from the Outkick Network. We appreciate everybody for joining us for what is going to be a fun night from Top Golf Nashville. Big thanks, though, really, to Hutton, Withrow, Kaharski. These guys are awesome. They bring the energy, and most importantly, they love interacting with the people here of Nashville and of Middle Tennessee. And it just makes it fun when we're raising money for uh, you know, for LLS and, and doing just really neat things here at Top Golf. Jonathan Hutton came up with this idea of the Outkick 360 Masters a few years ago before this show existed. That's how much foresight he had. We're going to raise a bunch of money, we're going to knock out blood cancer, and uh, we're going to feel good about it while we have some drinks and hit some golf balls. It's a tremendous idea. So look, here's basically the way that I live my life. I knew I wasn't going to be the best guy out here golfing, swinging a club, so I just made sure I was the best dressed, the best looking guy out here. Somebody had to do it. We knew it wasn't going to be Paul. We've seen Chad's shoes. It had to be me. Been waiting to break this shirt out for about 18 months now. Thanks a lot, COVID. But it debuted today. It's a big hit. Best dressed guy out here. What can I say? It just happens sometimes. So we're having a great night. We're raising money to fight cancer, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Big props to Catfish Jake and his efforts to be man of the year for LLS. And also Jonathan Hutton, who's done a great job. Could not ask for better people here tonight. It's been fun. Please join us next year. Making it rain and changing not lives, but lines. It's our daily parlay, Outkick 360, and it's Jacob Swanson that changes and shifts lines in Las Vegas because the man wins parlays. Our biggest win as a, as a group, 85 bucks on a three-leg parlay <laughs> last night. That was a preposterous parlay. Uh, ridiculous. And that, that that's the beauty of the whole and thing. He won. We found a dispassionate <laughs> sports fan. Oh who uh, is willing to go against the grain. And listen, when you win the $85 one, that gets you off the hook for all of these losses. <laughs> Not you, Jacob, because you've us. been winning. Us. Us. By you, I mean us. Uh, Jacob, you have the honor of going back-to-back -back with parlay picks yet again. Second week in a row, it's returned to you. Let's end the week and go. Let, let's continue this. I want to end the week with you Glory. tomorrow picking Bathing another parlay. Glory. Oh, yeah, we've got the Atlanta Hawks money line okay. under 215 and a half points. And Chris Middleton is going to make three or more three pointers. That so is at our least, bet. I like it. Uh, at least three threes by Chris Middleton. That seems like a no brainer I, element of it to me. I'm surprised that number under is. Under 215 lowest. and a half is what I'm most concerned about. The Hawks, without Giannis playing for the Bucks tonight. I would take the Hawks' money line as well, just on a separate bet with FanDuel. Um, there's your three-team parlay, the three-leg parlay. Same game parlay here for the Hawks and Bucks tonight. Under without Giannis and potentially still Trey Young in jeopardy. I think there's a shot at the under there. Yes, uh, $5 wager, total payout thirty-seven sixty-five. Now, speaking of the Hawks, you if you are a first-time user to FanDuel, FanDuel.com slash OK360. You can place up to a $5 bet, 30 to 1 odds on either the Bucks or the Hawks tonight. Just a win. Straight money line bet to win. 30 to 1 odds for first-time users. FanDuel.com slash OK360. Paul, let's wrap up with uh, and, and a bit of a tease for tomorrow's show and discussion in the Tennessee Power Hour. 
uh, on the back end of uh, the VolQuest Power Hour with, with Brent Hubbs tomorrow. Kevin Byard and how he was used, how he was deployed last year versus what you hope to expect in 2021 <laughs> because based on Byard standards, he didn't meet them. No, it's a bad year. It's a really bad year. He, he had a bad year. Part of the reason, I think, is because of the way they deployed him. And we, nobody's touched on this, really. There's one guy in Europe who really uh, counted down what they did with him defensively. Romeo Crennel is a proponent of this. He plays his safeties left and right. And the Titans did a lot of this last year. Kevin Byard played 75% of his snaps on the left. Now, this is fine if you have interchangeable safeties, but I can't... Uh, who is going to tell you that Kevin Byard <laughs> and Kenny Vaccaro, who was slipping last Byard, year, Byard, or Kevin Byard and Amani Hooker? He's a center fielder yes, playing with Vaccaro, who afraid. was almost an extra linebacker at times. Not Should even have been. Yes. And Hooker is much more a box guy. Yeah. Now, we don't say this is an insult. Box safety gets thrown around as an insult. It's not an insult. No. If you're a good box, safety is a high value player. Um, but for uh, and listen, Bayard playing on the left, all those snaps on the left didn't mean he wasn't a free safety. He was a free safety, you know, a, a percentage of those times when he was on the left. But he needs to be the free safety, and they need to play free and strong. I would argue, and I hope they'll get back to that. He clearly was a much better player, and there were other mitigating factors on his game and on the defense. But I say get away from left right, get to strong free. Hooker is very much a strong safety. Byard's very much a free safety. If you want to stray from that a little bit to not be that predictable, that's fine. But the fact of the matter is, with Kevin Byard being a predictable free safety the three years before that, he intercepted 17 passes. Last year, being unpredictable, he intercepted one. One. So what's the benefit of being unpredictable there? Less production. Pass rush will help him no matter where he's playing. We can throw that out there, too. Yeah. All uh, it, it all comes together. Listen, every time Hutton and I are going to talk about the defense, <laughs> there's going to be a mention of Health the pass and rush. pass rush. We, yeah. They need both. They need both. We are back at it tomorrow where we have the Tennessee Power Hour, including Brent Hubs from VolQuest.com. Much to discuss with name, image, and likeness. A lot to discuss as Jacob Swanson tries to make it two for two with the 360 parlay and much more. We'll hit all the headlines tomorrow going into the big, long weekend for July 4th. Until then, hit us up on social media. Follow and like the page on YouTube. You can subscribe there. Just search out OutKick360. Let's Thanks go, to everyone. Let's go from a two-shot. Stay in a two-shot here. Don't block the box. Now one shot. But do lock <laughs> the locks. Do.